till today what did we do we completed uh, uh, the protozoans the poriferas and the cnidarians then we uh, yesterday talked about uh, platyhelminthes and uh, today we will be talking about ashelminthes and um, i think today is the uh, last um, online class as of uh, the information that they gave me today i don't know next uh, when you people will be starting your class so today i'll be completing ashelminthes and then we'll uh, start with the uh, annelids and uh, i i at least need another four classes to complete uh, your syllabus when is your exams from feb 11th ma'am yes feb 11th oh so you don't have much time no ma'am uh, in that case uh, you should uh, ask the admin for uh, is it okay if i can take a uh, continuous uh, four days class uh, um no problem. Okay, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, we will not be if we wait up till Saturday, Sunday, we will not be able to complete your portion. Um, but um, according to your information and my information, today is the last class, right? Yes, yes ma'am. Um, but we won't be able to complete our portion in this uh, just uh, six classes. So let's see. I'll uh, uh, try to uh, ask the management for another four classes. And if that is so, we will try to complete the portion. Um, yeah, so I hope uh, almost 27 participants are here. Uh, shall we start with the class then? Yes, ma'am. So, okay, so we will uh, start with the, the ash elementus. And um, what I want you all to understand from this uh, uh, slide is, uh, we almost talked about uh, porifera, cylindrates, up till platyhelminthus. So when you're talking about the screen over here, kingdom animalia, under kingdom animalia, this animalia can be divided into cellular components. That is at the level of organization over here, we'll be talking about the cellular component and tissue, organ, and organ system. So our animals are completely divided according to the level of organization. So when you're talking about the level of organization at cellular level, we talked only about poriferans over here because they were only made up of cells and uh, not tissue or uh, specialized organs. So only cells were there. So we talked about uh, poriferans uh, under the cellular uh, division over there. Then when we talk about the symmetry, that is whether it is radial symmetry or uh, bilateral symmetry, uh, under radial symmetry, we talked about cylindrates and tenophores. Um, uh, those were the examples that we did uh, under the uh, radial symmetry over there. Then um, when you're talking about the germinal layer, that is uh, the uh, ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm, uh, we talked about diploplastic and triploblastic. So when you're talking about diploblastic, we were talking only about two germ layers, uh, that is ecto and the endoderm. There was no mesoderm over there. But when we are talking about triploblastic cells, then we are talking about all the three germ layers, that is the uh, ecto, meso, and the endoderm. Then when we talked about body cavity, we spoke about uh, yesterday's class, we sp uh, spoke about acylomate. Acylomate, there was no thylom at all, absence of body cavity is called a coelomate. And uh, today we'll be talking about one more coelomate that is pseudo coelomate. Pseudo, pseudo means false. So here uh, it is not a true coelom or it is not a true body cavity, but you can call them as pseudo or false. Pseudo means false coelomate. And we will also talk uh, later on about coelom that is um, uh, true coeloms, uh, true body cavity, fine. Then uh, when we are talking about development, under development, you will be talking about protostome and deuterostome. So what is the difference between a protostome and deuterostome? Our animal kingdom is divided again according to the development of the mouth and the anus. When the blastocyst, that is when the zygote is undergoing cell division, they uh, when they invaginate, the, the invagination forms a blastopore. Now, when the blastopore is formed over here, 
the blastopore if it forms uh, the uh, mouth part then that becomes the protostome but a blastopore when it becomes a anus opening then it is called a deuterostomes so that is how the uh, development also is occurring over there then uh, according to the notochord we'll be talking about the uh, absence of the notochord and the presence that is the vertebral column absence of the notochord and the um, uh, present of the notochord so the if if there is notochord is present then all those comes under chordates that is the pisces uh, the reptiles the, uh, the aves and all those things and the mammals of course and if they are absent that is when the backbone is absent all these comes under uh, the other uh, uh, coelomates that is the annelids the mollusca the arthropoda the echinoderms and uh, the echinoderms and the chordate they come under notochord whereas absence of notochord is annelids mollusca and arthropoda here when we are talking about the development here uh, acelomates we yesterday talked about platyhelminthes now today under pseudo coelomates you will be talking about nematodes nematodes are nothing but uh, nemathi helminthes uh, they will be named uh, uh, in three different names so you don't get confused nematode or nemathi helminthes or it is called as ash helminthes so you can just make a quick uh, note in your book nematode or nemathi helminthes or ash helminthes so these are the three words all the three words are the same that is uh, we'll be talking in the pseudo coelomate so this is the classification of uh, the different uh, animals ma over there I one doubt ma'am yeah ma can you give some examples about the protostome deuterostome no? all the protostomes that is the annelids molluscan and arthropods come under protostomes okay right Okay. and all the uh, the echinoderms and the chordate they come under deuterostomes they are the well developed forms deuterostomes clear clear yeah, so so if you can see in this picture the protostome that is in the purple color annelids mollusca and arthropoda all these three are protostomes and under deuterostome which is red in color the echinoderm and chordates are deuterostomes fine as simple as that clear clear ma'am So we'll start with our class phylum Ash helminthes, which is also called as Nemathi helminthes, or also called as Nematode. So don't get confused. Nemathi helminthes, Ash helminthes, or Nematodes are all the same. So coming to Nemathi helminthes or Ash helminthes, what exactly you mean by the word Nemathi helminthes? Nemathi or Nematodes means according to Greek word, it's thread like worms uh, a thread like worms is called as uh, nematodes or nematodes which is also known as nematy helminthes now why it is called as ash helminthes again ash helminthes means again ash means cavity uh, the pseudocoelom that we are talking about the body cavity that is present in, inside is called as uh, ash so the cavity present in these worms is called as ash helminthes or cavity worms okay so that is now you can see in this picture over here they are thread like uh, worms so you can see all, all over here they are thread like worms and of course uh, inside the body you have a cavity so that cavity is again called as ash helminthes so all the both the names are the same nematode nemathi helminthes or ash helminthes is what we are going to talk about so if they ask you to describe about nemathi helminthes don't get confused uh, madam we only uh, uh, read about ash helminthes we don't know about nemathi helminthes no nemathi and ash helminthes is one and the same okay so what is the next one characters and classification so we'll talk about a little bit about the characters of uh, uh, the ash helminthes or the nematode worms many round worms that live as parasite in plants and animals both so you can find them in both plants and animals uh, they cause serious agricultural problem if they are affecting the plants and if they are affecting the animals uh, they are going to uh, have a serious veterinary problem and human health problems are also caused because of this uh, round worms and the round worms are also free living Uh, which occur uh, in fresh water sea water and in the soil because mostly um, if if it is in the water uh, due to contamination humans are affected even uh, even the animals are affected and uh, if it is in the soil also 
uh, because the children, they always uh, love to play in the soil and they easily take away the mud and put it in their mouth is when the children also are affected by this roundworm. So you have to be careful with them. 28,000 species of nematode identified till date. Yesterday, Platyhelminthus, we, we saw 15,000 species and in nematodes, we are going to talk about 28,000 species uh, identified till date. Maybe there are uh, new ones also uh, around. Uh, and as I said, as a zoologist, uh, if you all are uh, uh, getting into the research line, you may also come across some new, new uh, animals in the um, universe and in the earth. And um, you, also, you all also can name those animals and um, you can also have uh, your name etched in the signs. Okay, body form, uh, they are roundworms. That's why they are called roundworms. Uh, they are round and cylindrical in structure and uh, uh, they are unsegmented. Yesterday we saw the proglottids. They were transverse sections over there, proglottids, though they are not truly segmented. Uh, here, they are, uh, those lines are also not to be seen. So they are unsegmented. There is no body divisions in between. Body wall, uh, non-living resistant cuticle. The body is covered by cuticle again. Why cuticle? Yesterday, again, I said they have to protect themselves from the uh, host digestive juices because digestive juices contains uh, hydrochloric acid, the amylase, the lipase, uh, uh, all these might uh, um, kill the uh, skin layers. So to avoid the digestive juices of the host, uh, these uh, worms have to have a thick cuticle so that uh, they can survive in the uh, environment inside. Syncytial epidermis. Uh, can anyone tell me what exactly is syncytial epidermis? Yesterday I discussed about this. Anyone? Syncytial epidermis? If you have listened to Platyhelminthus, I was talking about this. Any student? I hope you must have made a note of this in your rough book. Or uh, you all are just uh, enjoying my um, audio without writing anything. Thinking that uh, this video is already on the YouTube, you can just go back again and listen to it. Uh, don't do that. Um, Please, whatever is important, whenever I say something important, please make a note of it in your rough book so that uh, you can just quickly go through it because uh, always during the examination point of view, um, a quick review of some important uh, terminologies, if you just uh, note it down and if you can uh, go through during your, just before your exam, uh, it is going to be very helpful for you all. Uh, you can just with one word, you can write paragraphs and paragraphs. That is what I want to say. So just um, make a note of it. Yes, ma. Uh, it is the epidermis which has huge number of nuclei in it. Huge number of nuclei. Uh, can I take that? No. E, uh, all the cells are put together. They they come close together, lie between uh, with one another close together. So that makes us uh, look like uh, uh, they have multinucleated because all these cells are close by. So that is why it is called as syncytial epidermis. That is why they look like continuous layer of cytoplasm with scattered nuclei. But each cell is close by. So that is called as syncytial epidermis. And of course, it is having a muscle layer. And also you can say, I want you all to see the mouth region of your triradiate mouth. So this is uh, the flap, the three... Uh, rectangular flaps over here. So this is the mouth region. I'll be discussing about uh, what a triradiate uh, mouth is all about. Okay, body cavity, as we said, is made up of pseudocene. So this part over here, the complete opening over here is a pseudocene. And uh, there's an ectoderm, the mesoderm that is uh, broken in between over here on the sides. And you have a pseudoseal, pseudo false seal is cavity. Pseudo seal means false body cavity is the meaning of pseudo seal or pseudo -seal Then you have an endoderm inside, complete round one is the endoderm. So uh, usually if it is a true seal then the mesoderm is broken in between and the seal is uh, connected from inside and outside by the mesodermal uh, layer. But here, uh, the mesoderm is on towards one side and there is a body cavity in the, uh, in the 
in between the mesoderm and the endoderm. Hence, this is not called a true coelom, but a pseudo coelom. And uh, yeah, you can uh, also look at a, a transfer section of this worm. If we are going to cut this into half and see the what is there inside them, uh, this is how the surface looks like. Uh, this is the ectoderm outside layer. Inside is the muscle. The muscle is made up of columnar cells, the column-like structures. You can see the uh, cells over here. So they are the muscles are made up of columnar cells. Uh, that is a cylindrical uh, cells, like uh, elongated cylindrical cells. So they are called as columnar cells. Uh, if they are uh, square shaped, then you call them as cuboidal cells. But here it is made up of columnar cells. And there's a pseudocelome. Uh, and then uh, the, the tube that is the endoderm present in between. And uh, the pseudoceal is filled with a pseudocelomic fluid, um, like uh, what our brain is uh, filled with uh, the, uh, the, the cerebrospinal fluid. Between the skull and the brain, you have a fluid. So that is called the cerebrospinal fluid. And in the joints also, you have the synovial fluid in between. Uh, so in the same way, the pseudocelome is filled with pseudocelomic fluid. Uh, what is the importance of it? Uh, it is, there is a lot of importance for this. This acts as a, a structure. The pseudocelomic fluid gives a structure to the worms uh, because of the present. It acts somewhat like muscles uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the worm. And also during uh, the transformation of uh, nutrients, uh, to the uh, each and every body uh, cell of the worm, uh, the pseudocelomic fluid helps them in uh, transporting the nutrients and uh, uh, excretion also. It helps in uh, removal of uh, the urea and ammonia from the body. So that is the importance of uh, the pseudocelomic fluid and of course the body cavity. Digestive system is complete with muscular pharynx. The elementary canal is not well developed over here in the ascaris because uh, they don't have to do a lot of work over here. Why? Because uh, everything is ready-made for them because they are surviving in the host. Uh, whatever the host is feeding them, uh, they, are just, they just have to suck them and feed themselves. They don't have to work very hard. The complete digested food is ready. It's something like you go to a hotel and the food is ready. You just have to heat and come the same way. Uh, they don't have to work much. That is the reason why digestive tract is not well developed. It just uh, uh, it, it just has a muscular pharynx. Um, why? Because uh, due to the peristaltic movement, they are able to suck the food and take them inside. That is a digestive tract. Skeletal, respiratory, and circulatory system are absent. So skeletal is absent. Why? Because they don't. They are not made up of any bones over here, and uh, that's the reason why they are. Uh, um, uh, invertebrates over there and um, uh, and also uh, the skeletal uh, system is replaced by the pseudocelomic cavity where the fluid is present in them and um, uh, gaseous exchange that is the exchange of oxygen or carbon dioxide uh, is uh, in aerobic respiration occurs by diffusion through body surface what do you mean by diffusion the skin uh, the diffusion occurs. It, it can just go inside, come outside. So that's called diffusion through the skin, uh, through the body surface, uh, the respiration is occurring. And the uh, circulatory system is, of course, taken care of the pseudocelomic fluid, which transport the material from one uh, part of the body to another part over there. Okay. Excretory system over there. You have three types of uh, system. That is three types of examples are given over here in this three. The first one is rhabditoid type of uh, worm. Uh, the, the second one is the ascaroid type of worm. And the third is an uh, ankylostoma. Each one having different types of um, excretory system. And the uh, excretory system resembles like the alphabet H over there. The anterior arms are short and the posterior arms are long over there. And uh, you also have, uh, uh, this is a lateral arm, anterior lateral arm, the uh, uh, uppermost part of the arms over there. And the lower ones is the posterior lateral arms. Then anterior arm is connected over here with a uh, excretory pore in the center. And uh, these arms are having a rennet cell over here a large rennet cell, which is made up of gland cells, uh, which helps in secretions. So they also help rennet, just underline that word, rennet cells. 
Uh, rennet is uh, nothing uh, but a gland. It is made up of glandular cells for secretions of. Uh, um, they also act as an excretory uh, type of uh, excreting a little bit of salts from the body. So that is a glandular rennet cells. You can also call them. And um, this is the ascorot type. In an ascorot type, you have very short uh, arms. The anterior arm is very short. And one side of the anterior arm, you have an excretory pore um, and also a small rennet cell that is present over there on, the, on one side of the anterior arm. Then in ankylostoma, you have a large rennet, uh, something like a thyroid gland. They look almost like a thyroid gland over there. And a single excretory pore, uh, no anterior arms, but uh, presence of posterior arms are uh, there over there. And uh, hence they are uh, a H shaped uh, excretory canal, complicated giant cells called rennet cells. So these are the giant rennet cells that are present over there. And um, ammonia is the main excretory matter. So mostly what is uh, thrown out of the body, ammonia. And uh, sometimes Ascaris uh, also excretes urea. Why urea? Whenever the body, uh, the host body is running short of water uh, during uh, summer season when the body is starving for water is when the Ascaris uh, excretes urea. All those animals, uh, which uh, uh, usually the reptiles uh, and all and the, the birds also, uh, because they want to restore the water in their body, they uh, try to excrete more amount of uh, urea, but uh, when there is excess of water, then ammonia is also excreted out. So that is the excretory system of uh, uh, the round worms. Nervous system over here, if you can see, there is a circumpharyngeal nerve ring. Um, earlier, we used to do this uh, uh, dissection in earthworm, wherein uh, we used to see that nerve ring at the anterior end, uh, a beautiful nerve, small nerve ring, which is uh, uh, almost uh, opaque in color. Um, yeah, uh, but uh, to uh, dissect a uh, nematode, uh, the nematode, it's very difficult. But you can see on the anterior region, so this is the pharynx, the muscular pharynx over here. And below the muscular pharynx, you have a, a nerve ring, which is also called as the circumpharyngeal uh, ring. It, it all, if this is a pharynx, it has a round structure over here. That is why it's called as a circum pharyngeal ring that gives rise to nerves. Uh, you can see all those pink color ones are the nerves and uh, they have you have a, a dorsal cord and a ventral cord uh, uh, up and down. Dorsal and ventral, that is dorsal on top and ventral below. So dorsal nerve cord and ventral nerve cord. And these two nerve cords are attached by the, uh, the transverse cords over there, which is also called as commissures. So you can see over here, so dorsal cord and the ventral cord are connected by the commissures over here. So they're all interconnected. Why? Because um, they don't have this axon extensions uh, like what we humans have. Um, the axons, uh, the sensory, um, the afferent and the efferent sensory organs over here, the nerves where the touch, uh, the moment you feel somebody is touching over here, the sense organs is uh, the the signals are sent to the brain and the brain sends the signal to the muscles to contract or expand. Uh, if you're touching anything hot, uh, the, the signals are sent to the brain and the brain tells the muscles to remove your hand, otherwise you're going to burn your hand. So here, uh, that is not present over here. So that each nerve ring have to be connected with one another in, an, in a commissure form so that um, when they come across any uh, any um, unfavorable condition, uh, they'll be able to escape from that place. So that is why they are made up of those commissures. So that is uh, the nervous system over there. And uh, sense organs, because they have to have proper sense organs where they are going to stay in the uh, internal uh, uh, environment. They have to have a little bit of sense organs and the sense organ, nothing but the papillae or uh, raised bumps, uh, uh, something like pimples. Yeah, if you remember the pimple, the bumps over there, remember that as papillae over here. So papillae occurs on the lips. Uh, I told you all how the triradiate lips is present in the uh, nematode over here. So the, there are some bumps like structures, papillae on the lips, on the sides of the anterior end in both male and female. 
and in front of the cloacal uh, apertures. So you have those papillae at the cloacal aperture and also in the uh, mouth region. So if you can see uh, this, uh, you have a outer labial papillae, that small, small dots over there. So those are the papillae that are present. Uh, this is a subdorsal lip, the lateral lip and the subventral lip all are having this uh, dot likes or bump like structures called the papillae and this papillae are uh, sensory in uh, nature that is uh, uh, they act as tactile in function tactile is um, they are very sensitive to touch if, if they come in contact with very unfavorable places uh, where they are not able uh, where they are not feeling uh, good enough uh, those are the uh, touch uh, sensory organs uh, to tell them that uh, they are uh, whether they are in a safe place or whether they are not in a safe place. So tactile in function, uh, sensitive to touch. And you have amphids. Now, if you can see, uh, this is the anterior region of the nematode and this is the posterior region that is a tail region. And the anterior near the mouth, you have these amphids. If you can see, if this is the mouth, uh, you can can you see that small uh, aperture over there, something uh, pit-like structure on this side and on the other side over there. So that is an amphid. Uh, the same thing you can see over here. So this is uh, the amphids near the mouth region over there. And there are phasmids at the cloacal region also. So this is a phasmid and that is an amphid. These both are also sensory in nature. Uh, amphids are present at the lips and they are chemoreceptors. Um, they are sensory to the chemicals uh, uh, chemicals present in the host, whichever the chemical they are taking in or uh, throwing it out. So they are chemoreceptors in nature. And sometimes they are also um, olfactory uh, chemoreceptors. Uh, uh, they are good in smelling also, olfactory chemoreceptors. Phasmids, unicellular glands, that is single cellular glands located upon the lateral sides of the posterior end and they are uh, glandulosensory in nature. So they are also uh, sensory in nature. They also secrete uh, some uh, secretions, glandulosensory in nature. And uh, where are they present? They are present on the lateral side. If this is the worm on either side, this is the lateral side. They are present on the lateral side of the um, uh, round worms. So that is the sensory organs. And coming to the um, sexes are separate, that is they are also called as dioecious, means two different individuals, male and a female. Till yesterday in the platyhelminthes, we saw they were hermaphrodites. What do you mean by hermaphrodites? Anybody? What do you mean male, and, male and female organs are present in same okay. animal. Same animal. So that is a hermaphrodite. But here, both male and females are separate. So sexes are separate and they are also called as dioecious. Generally, they show uh, dimorphism. That is, you can easily differentiate a male from a female. Uh, sometimes in animal kingdom, it is very difficult to differentiate a male and a female. For example, if I'm talking about uh, Drosophila, that small flies, uh, if you see them directly, uh, you will not be able to identify them. But uh, a closer look will tell you which is a male and which is a female. But here uh, uh, in roundworms, it is very easy to identify the male from that one. Female fertilization is internal. There is no external fertilization, and there is no asexual reproduction. So here the development may be direct or indirect, but mostly whatever we are reading is going to be uh, direct. That is, uh, uh, no larval form is called as direct, and some ascaris, uh, uh, some roundworms have larval forms, so they are called indirect development. During indirect development, that is what it says, larva is present. And what are the different types of larva we are going to talk about? We are going to talk about the filary form uh, larva, which is present in ankylostoma. One example, uh, ankylostoma has a filary form larva, which is also called as a hookworm. Microfilaria larva, which is found in Wukiria bancrofti, uh, which is also called as filarial worms. Uh, this filaria is very, very dangerous, uh, leads to elephantiasis, if you have heard. The elephant-shaped uh, legs uh, you find in some people who are infected with the microfilarial larva. And rhabditiform uh, larva present in Ascaris and Entrobius, uh, which is also called as pinworm. So you are going to talk about the hookworm, you're going to talk about the filarial worm, and also you're going to talk about the pinworm. Pin, uh, that small size of a pin. So that, that thin uh, is it. So here you can see how the larva looks like. 
This is a, a rabbitiform larva, a filary, uh, filariform larva, and uh, you also have a microfilarial larva. So uh, among all this, microfilarial larva is very dangerous because they are going to uh, um, affect as elephant tises. Although uh, nowadays elephant tises is very less in early days. Uh, this picture you can see, this is uh, uh, shown live under the microscope uh, inside the circulatory system. So this is the size of the worm that is present in the circulatory system. So that is microfilaria. And uh, nowadays you find uh, see less amount of uh, elephant tises, but in early days uh, when there was no proper uh, cleanliness around, uh, people were easily infected with this uh, elephant tises um, with that huge uh, uh, hind limbs uh, you find in them. Okay, coming to Ash Elminthus classification again, only up till class we are going to talk about uh, phylum nematoda or nematyelminthus or ash helminthus. So don't get confused. Nematoda, nematyelminthus or ash helminthus, one and the same. So under phylum uh, nematoda, we are going to talk about class A phasmida and phasmida. What do you mean by this A phasmida? Uh, when we are talking about the general characters, I, I was talking about the lateral side phasmids at the cloacal region. All those roundworms which do not have Phasmida, it's, they come under A phasmida. Uh, example, uh, Griffella and uh, Trichinella are the examples under A phasmida. And under phasmida, that is presence of the phasmids, uh, example is Ascaris, Wikiria, and Ankylostoma. So these are the uh, classification of Ashelminthus over here. And uh, we'll be talking a little bit of uh, A phasmida and phasmida. Class A phasmida are also called as adenophorae. Uh, phasmids are absent. That's why they are called as A phasmida. Whenever you put an A in front of any word, that means that is absent. So uh, uh, likewise, uh, A coelomate, no coelome present or uh, body cavity is absent. So whenever you put an A, remember that it is an absence of that particular organ. A phasmida, that is phasmid or the sensory organs is absent in this particular class. Amphids of various types, rarely pore-like. So amphids, where you find amphids? At the anterior region uh, near the mouth. So they are various types and rarely pore-like. Excretory system absent. If present, they are poorly developed. Well-developed mesenterial tissues, the internal tissues, mesenterial tissues are well-developed. Caudal adhesive glands are present. So uh, instead of the phasmid, you have a caudal adhesive glands uh, so that they can get attached by the from the caudal region. Example over here, uh, enoplus. So this is an enoplus and you also have dorylimus, mermis. So you can see this uh, uh, thread-like structures over here. So mermis, uh, monohysteria and desmo uh, scolex. So uh, desmo scolex. This is a particular structure of a desmo scolex over here you can find the mouth region over here and the tail region. This is uh, this was uh, uh, very recently recorded uh, by some uh, zoologists over here um, from uh, Rushukulia estuaries. So this uh, was found over there. So you have this A phasmida. Coming to the next class, phasmida or uh, Cesernente is the another name for phasmidia. Phasmids present, pore-like amphids, well-developed excretory system, weakly developed mesenterial system. So here, if one is developed better, the other one is not well developed. So here, excretory system is well developed, whereas the mesenterial tissues are not well developed. No caudal adhesive glands because they are having fast media, so say they don't need a caudal adhesive glands. Example, uh, trichinella, rabditis, ascaris, ankylostoma, draconculus, wukiria, and microfilaria uh, are the examples over here. So this, this is what I was talking about, the elephantiasis. Uh, if this worms infect the uh, lymphatic uh, system in the limbs, uh, the lymphatic uh, uh, cells, they enlarge in size. And because of the enlargement, uh, uh, the body uh, is filled with uh, fluid over here. So that is the reason why the leg looks like that of an elephant leg. So that is the reason. The, another name for this uh, microfilaria is elephantiasis. 
and this is a Wuchiria uh, roundworm, and this is an Ankylostoma uh, roundworms. Okay, so this was about the general characters of uh, roundworm, and also we talked about the classification. What are the two classes of uh, Nem uh, Nemethi helminthes? A phasmida and phasmida. Now we are going to talk about Ascaris lumbricoides. Ascaris lumbricoides belongs to which class? I was just talking about. Anybody? Phasmida. Very good. Phasmida. Why? Because presence of phasmids are present over there. Good. So I have some attentive students in my class. Good. So coming to type study, Ascaris lumbricoides. Uh, it's an endoparasite. Endo means living inside is an endoparasite. Where they, where do you find them? In the small intestine. Why in a small intestine? Is where you have proper, uh, completely digested food is present in the small intestine. So these um, uh, roundworms can uh, easily have uh, their ready-made food. Uh, you uh, order from the swiggy and eat it. It's something like that. Uh, in the intestine, uh, the food is ready-made and they just have to uh, suck the food and uh, they can survive inside. And uh, uh, lying freely in the lumen of the intestine found more commonly in the children than in adults. Why? Because the children are prone to eating uh, the soil because they keep playing in the soil. Uh, they love mud. They touch here and there. And then immediately after touching anything, the hand directly goes into the mouth is a safest way to enter into a children. So mostly you find them in Yeah, sorry, ma. I just lost a current, so I was unable to uh, come on to the meeting. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. Ma sorry for the disturbance. Um, 
let me open my file. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry you can't see me <laughs> because I don't have pen. Let me just open. Yeah, uh, I hope you can see me now. Fine. So where were we? Right. So commonly on the children, and uh, sometimes it uh, might from intestine to uh, the stomach and comes out through the mouth. Remember this. Just uh, have a look. It migrates from the stomach, uh, intestine to the stomach, and yeah, thankfully, to stomach and the stomach it comes out mouth or nostrils of the host. Right. So. Uh, this is what uh, you can see over here. So they're so dangerous. They can keep moving from place to other place and can even come out from the mouth or through the nostrils also. You can see that is this can be uh, seen in really infected patients, uh, wherein uh, uh, sometimes you can have almost 500 to 5,000 uh, worms in one human. So that can be uh, the dangerous uh, uh, problem uh, because of this round worms. Mode of nutrition. I don't know, it's uh, giving me a lot of problem today. So more of uh, nutrition, holozoic, am I audible? Sorry for the disturbance. Yes, ma'am, audible. No. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. More of holozoic as it feeds on host's uh, partly digested food by sucking action of its pharynx. The pharynx is well developed in the round one uh, because muscular, as I told you all, uh, due to that peristaltic movement, they are able to uh, suck the um, uh, digested food easily. Okay. It produces enzymes to protect itself from the action of host enzymes. So you can uh, understand the cuticle produces some anti-enzymes so that they can um, uh, uh, evade the digestive juices of the host cell and then they can survive. Reproduction, sexual reproduction, life cycle is simple and monogenetic. There is no secondary host over here, like uh, the platyhelminthes. So uh, here, uh, it doesn't need any uh, intermediate host uh, or a secondary host, a single host, that is man. It will go out and then come back to man itself. So that is why they are called monogenetic. Uh, in one species, we saw digenetic, digenia, two, uh, two digenes. Here it is mono, mono means single, monogenetic or single host is enough for them to survive. External features, if you can see over here, um, you have an excretory pore, the dot over there, uh, and then uh, the triradiate mouth. I'll show you all how the shape looks like. The mouth over there on top, excretory pore. Um, th there's a lateral line. So you can see the line over here. Uh, uh, so for example, if this, um, let me show you. If this is a worm, this is a dorsal side. The back side will be the ventral side. On the sides on either side, that will be the lateral. Okay. So this is the lateral side, the dorsal and back side is the ventral. So they are all made up of uh, the lateral lines, the dorsal line and the ventral line. Here in this picture, you can only see the lateral line, a broad lateral line. The dorsal line and the ventral line are very thin, um, narrow uh, lines, but the uh, lateral line is broader one. And uh, there's a female gonophore over here. And uh, you have a cloacal aperture. Uh, in males, you have a cloacal apertures, whereas in females, you have an anus. Uh, my differences will be uh, in the coming slides. And how you differentiate? We told that uh, the male and a female can be differentiated very easily. How you can differentiate? 
uh, the male's tail is always curved. So you can see the tail region is always curved like that. Whereas in a female, it is a straight one. So it is a straight. So by the moment you see the uh, worms, if it is curved, you're going to say that it is a male. And if it is straight, you're going to say that's a female. So that is dimorphism. That's what we are talking about. Um, and then uh, at the cloacal aperture, you have pineal setae, sensory organs, uh, found only in the males and not in the female uh, roundworm. So that is, again, uh, another difference over there. OK. And um, females, again, uh, the length of the female. The females are longer than the males. Uh, if the female is anywhere between 20 to 41 centimeters, um, a male uh, is only about 15 to 31 centimeters. And the posterior uh, tail is curved. So that is the external features, how you uh, differentiate a male and a female. And please don't forget about the lateral line, the ventral and the dorsal line. OK. Morphology, uh, when I was talking about the lips over there, if you can see in this picture over there, uh, you have a triradiate uh, lips, tri, three radiated lips. The dorsal one is an um, elliptical shaped uh, lip, whereas the two ventral side is an oval shaped lips over there. So that's why it is uh, known as tri, three radiating lips, tri radiate. Body is covered with a smooth, tough, elastic cuticle because they have to be very tough with a striated transversely uh, uh, appearance. That is the muscles are made up of transverse appearance, uh, giving uh, the look like um, they are pseudo segmented, false segmentation, but they don't have segments. Cylindrical body has four longitudinal epidermal cords visible externally. That's what I was uh, talking about one mid dorsal, one mid ventral, and two lateral uh, lines. And uh, the lateral and the ventral cords appear white in color, whereas the lateral, the side ones appear brown in color. Anterior mouth is bound by six lips. Remember, here I told you all only three, but there he says is it's having six, li uh, six lips. All these six lips, they get fused up to form three. So they are going to form only three like that. So a tri-radiate lips is what they are going to talk about. Uh, the six lips or labia uh, reduced by fusion to three nascaris, one elliptical. So this is an elliptical mid dorsal and the two are oval laterally. So that is what uh, it is made up of over there. And therefore the mouth is a tri radiate apertures. The lips have fine teeth. So they have some small fine teeth on the lips. Behind the lips, there's a pair of cervical papillae I told you all papillae are bump-like structures, uh, which are sensory in nature. So they have a cervical papillae and uh, one on each side close to the nerve rings, all papillae are sensory in nature. And um, yeah, the posterior end is a transverse uh, anus uh, in a female, whereas there is a cloacal aperture in a male. And uh, they also have uh, chitinous spicules. So this is a chitinous spicules or pineal setae. In the male near the cloaca, there is a cuticular elevation ventrally. So if you can see, this is the uh, ventral, uh, the tail region of the male, where it is having uh, 50 pairs of pre-anal papillae, 50 pairs. That is almost 100 papillae are present at the cloacal region over here in the males, which is not found in the females. That is one more uh, point you have to remember uh, if you're talking about uh, the difference between a male and a female uh, uh, nematodes. Okay, so in the males, you have over here 50 pairs. 50 pairs is equal to 100 papillae of the pre-anal region. That is, if um, the anal region is somewhere over here, at the pre-anal region, you have from here, you will have a lot of uh, papillae over there. And five pair of post-anal papillae, five pairs. That is 10 post-anal Papillae is present at the uh, tail end of the um, nematode over there. So that is one uh, important uh, difference. There's a short post anal tail, which is straight in a female. So it's just a straight uh, uh, end or in a female, uh, but sharply curved in a male. So that is again a difference over there. So and then you have a papillae at the mouth region, uh, then a ventral line. 
an, an excrete report that is present on either side over there. And this is a triradiate uh, um, lips over there, you find. So this is a triradiate elliptical uh, anterior region and two ventral uh, ones, which is uh, oval in shape. So this is the shape of the mouth. Body wall uh, consists of outer cuticle, mid subcuticle or epidermis and hypodermis or the inner muscular layer. So outer cuticle, inside mid subcuticle or epidermis and inside that is a hypodermis. So first is a cuticle, mid and you have an hypodermis uh, or the inner muscle layer. So three layers of the body. Uh, cuticle is uh, tough, thick, wrinkled and transparent outermost layer of the body continues with a cuticular lining of uh, pharynx and, and the rectum. Epidermis, below the cuticle is the epidermis made up of syncytial epidermis, again, because of the layering of the cells together, syncytial epidermis with many nuclei, but no cell walls. Uh, nuclear lie in the longitudinal epidermal cords only and epidermis secretes cuticle and forms four longitudinal thickening that is the epidermal cords we talked about and uh, the lateral line contains excretory canals the lateral side contains the excretory canals and the dorsal and the ventral uh, lines contains the nerves so dorsal and the ventral contains the nerves which are sensory in action and uh, ventral uh, cords contains the excretory canals for the excretion purpose. Muscle layer. What is the muscle layer made up of over here? Uh, internal to the epidermis is lining the muscle layer. So first we talked about the cuticle, then we talked about the mid epidermal layer. Now we are going to talk about the muscle layer which is inside. Uh, the line between the epidermal cords in the body wall Musculature consisting exclusively of single layer of longitudinal fibers running along the length of the body. Here, the muscles are made up of longitudinal fibers. So they run uh, throughout the body. Muscle lie in four quadrants. So that is, uh, that is uh, two ventral and dorsal and uh, um, ventral nerve and two lateral uh, nerve, uh, the cords. So muscles are made up of four quadrants. They are divided into four uh, quadrants being separated by these longitudinal cords on either side. Each quadrant has about 150 muscle cells. So one quadrant, when I'm talking about one quadrant from the uh, ventral uh, cord till the lateral cord, this is one from here till here one, that side. So each four ones having 150 muscle cells. Contraction of these elongated muscle causes twisting and bending. It's sometimes twists and moves, twists and moves. So very slowly they contract and expand so that they move from one region to another region over there. They, they cause uh, twisting and bending of the body results into undulating movement of ascaris to counteract the peristaltic activity of the host intestine. Peristaltic activity of the host intestine. What do you mean by that peristaltic? Because as the foot is moving in the intestine, the uh, intestine has to contract and expand. Uh, they have to move. So that is the reason why they move from uh, the stomach to intestine, from that intestine, the small intestine, and then they have to go into the large intestine. How is it happening? It's happening because of the peristaltic uh, movement of the uh, intestines. So because they have to uh, counterattack the movement, if they're not able to have proper muscles in their body, they'll be washed off. So to avoid that washing away, they have this uh, well-built muscles so that they can uh, strongly attach. Why? Because they don't have the uh, suckers like what you had in the platyhelminthus. They had those suckers, so they, they, they just have to attach onto the body wall and nothing happens, whatever comes. But here, they are free living in the intestine, as we said. They can keep moving from one place to another they have to have a proper muscle in the body so that they can uh, stay in the intestine. So that is the muscle layer over there. And uh, body cavity, we talked about, they are pseudocele. So this is the whole thing inside is a pseudocele where they have, um, these are all the different uh, parts that are present. Uh, the reproductive system uh, of the female uh, picture that is transverse section of a mature female is shown over here. And um, so the whole thing, the white color ones are the pseudocele that is present over here. 
and uh, this is the muscular portion of the muscles as i said what is the shape of the muscles uh, in in ascaris what is the shape i told is it columnar or cuboidal anyone columnar ma'am very good so you can see the shape of here so they are of columnar in shape so the muscles are columnar over here and this is a syncytial epidermis we were talking about the outer side is a cuticle round cuticle inside is a syncytial epidermis you can see those uh, scattered nucleus you can see all those dark dark uh, dots over there is that scattered nucleus because all those are put uh, staying together so that is the reason why you find them as uh, they are having lot of uh, nucleus in each cell but they are Uh, put together uh, cells of this, so that is called a syncytial epidermis. And below the epidermis, you have the muscular layer inside. And after the muscular layers, you have this pseudo seal present inside. So this is the pseudo seal, and this is the endoderm. Endoderm having intestinal brush border. Uh, then uh, that is the intestinal epithelium and intestinal lumen present over here. So this is uh, how they look like in a transverse section of um, the Round ones, and also you can see over here the lateral nerve cord, the lateral line. So these two are the lateral line, and this is the dorsal nerve cord, and this is the ventral nerve cord. So from one point, from this uh, lateral nerve cord to ventral nerve cord, this is one quadrant. So this is first quadrant. From this point to this point is a second quadrant. From this point to this point is a third quadrant. and from dorsal nerve to the, again to the lateral side is one quadrant so you have four quadrants and each quadrant is made up of 150 muscle cells so these are the muscle cells and they are made up of 150 each in each quadrant over here so 150 here 150 there 150 and 150 totally how much uh, you have 600 muscle cells present in each um, uh, ascaris lumbricoid so that is uh, the body cavity um embryologically it does not develop like a true coelom that's why they are called pseudo coelom and they are not lined uh, because they are not lined by the mesodermal cells so the uh, hence they are called as pseudo seals and um, they remain filled with fluid containing mobile phagocytic cells present in the fluid so that is the body cavity over there coming to digestive system in ascaris How how is the uh, digestive system in Ascaris? Uh, don't forget to uh, um, remember this question. If they ask you to uh, write about the uh, type study of Ascaris, you will have to mention all these points in Ascaris because in the uh, nematodes, this is the only important question. Uh, if they ask you to write, this is the only important. If uh, they will uh, ask you to write in detail about Ascaris lumbricoids, when they ask you that. then you will have to talk about all this the external features of the ascaris uh, how do you differentiate a male and a female uh, how they are made up of how is the muscle layer uh, what is the digestive system excretory system all this you will have to mention and uh, if you really want good marks uh, you will have to always draw the diagram correctly name it correctly draw it neatly and uh, label it perfectly we don't need any colorful diagrams uh, we, we don't ask you to take color pencils to draw the diagram with a simple pencil if you are going to draw a neat labeled diagram definitely the examiner will be impressed by the way you present your uh, answers and um, definitely you will definitely get 90% and above um, uh, if not uh, uh, less 80% you will definitely get 90% and i'm sure Uh, all of you will definitely pass by distinction yes uh, a neat label diagram is what an uh, an examiner would like to see in your paper because we are not any uh, bcom students or uh, art student to just uh, write pages and pages of stories we don't need stories we want diagram the moment we see the diagram we will say okay this uh, student knows what uh, he or she is writing and we will um, give you all marks accordingly okay coming to the digestive system in ascaris alimentary canal associated with glands constitutes the digestive system what do you mean by a gland all our body is made up of glands and this glands helps in secretions of different types of secretory juices so that is the reason why uh, we have glands uh, for example we have sweat glands on the skin why because they secrete sweat 
So that is why we have uh, glands over there. We have some glands on our tongue to secrete the digestive uh, juices because the first digestion occurs in the mouth. Why? Because the moment, have you ever noticed, the moment we see something nice food, first thing is your mouth, uh, the, your mouth starts watering. What is that? It's a saliva. What is that saliva consisting of? It consists of a little bit of uh, digestive juices and also the lysozymes. And that is where first uh, the digestive juices mixes with the food inside. That's why they say chew your food properly because when you chew the food properly, all the digestive juices get mixed up with the food. And when it is going inside the stomach, one fourth of the digestion is already begun. And the rest of uh, rest half of the digestion occurs in the stomach, and the complete digestion occurs in your intestine. So uh, that's the reason why they say you have to have lots of uh, chewing capacity in your mouth. Okay, coming back to our point, glands. Why glands? They have to secrete some juices in the uh, body of the um, nematodes. Elementary canal, narrow tube, uh, straight tube, divisible into three regions. The club-shaped foregut. Um, uh, do I have the picture over there? Um, I'm so sorry, I don't have a picture. Mm. Yeah, uh, if you can see over here, uh, this is the um, mouth. From the mouth, it enters into a muscular pharynx. So this is a pharynx. And from the pharynx, uh, they, uh, the pharynx divides into two regions of uh, uh, a thick um, intestine on either side. Here, I don't have that intestine over here. So the mouth, the pharynx, and the intestine is what we'll be talking about over here. Uh, the club-shaped uh, foregut or esophagus, about 10 to 15 mm long uh, and lined with cuticle and uh, a narrow midgut of endodermal origin and the hindgut of rectum lined by cuticle. Mouth in the anterior region, bounded by three lips. I told you all the triradiated lips, um, one median and two dorsals. Mouth leads into the buccal cavity or the pharynx and the pharynx opens, uh, the use of figures also called the pharynx in a muscular bulb act as a suction tube. That is, they suck the digestive juices from the intestine, leads into the, uh, from the intestine, the use of figures leads into the intestine. Intestine is a straight tube of one layered epithelium bounded externally by cuticle. They are connected by the cuticle. Rectum or the terminal portion of the intestine opens to the exterior at the anus. So that is the elementary canal over there. Three branched esophageal glands, uh, branched esophageal glands that are present in the esophagus. One dorsal and two ventrolateral remain embedded in the muscle fibers. Why those glands? Because they have to secrete those juices inside. Feeding and digestion, how they take in the food and how the feeding occurs in the um, ascaris. They feed on host intestinal content, pre-digested food of the host, tissues and exudates of uh, or blood by sucking the, suc uh, by sucking the food uh, because of the muscular pharynx, they're able to suck the uh, host uh, digested food. Digestion is partly extracellular and partly intracellular. So uh, half of the digestion is extracellular uh, when the munching of the food and half yeah. the rest half yeah. is in the intracellular. When, who is that on the Lydia? Okay, the simplified food diffuses through the intestinal wall into the fluid filled body cavity and subsequently absorbed by the cells. What he says over here, from the intestine, that is uh, the animal's intestine, from the esophagus, when it goes into the esophagus and in the intestine, from the intestine, what of the food that has been collected diffuses into the coelomic fluid, right? From the food, once it is uh, diffused into the coelomic fluid of the nematode, the coelomic fluid uh, um, circulates the food to different parts of the uh, nematode uh, body walls. So that, that is what he said over here. The simplified food diffuses through the intestinal wall into the fluid filled body cavity and subsequently absorbed by the cells. Excess food may be uh, uh, stored as glycogen and fat in the epidermal, intestinal and epithelial and of course muscle cells. So excess food anywhere, excess food has to be uh, stored in the form of glycogen or fat, uh, which is what happens in humans also. 
the excess food that we eat, uh, the, all the carbohydrates are stored as glycogen and all the oil that we take in are um, stored as lipases or lipids or fat, what you call them as. Okay. And coming to the excretory system over here, we have already discussed how the shape of the excretory system resembles. They resemble like that of a head shape, but in Ascaris, here you can see uh, it, is a, it is having a very small anterior canal and a long posterior canal over here. And the anterior canal is attached to the excretory pore. And this is where the excretory pore opens. So this is an anterior canal and the excretory pore opens uh, at the anterior region itself. And it has a long um, ventral uh, uh, excretory canals over here uh, or the ventral side, uh, which is present over there or also called as posterior. So if they are anterior of that, these two are the posterior long extracurricular canal reaching up till the uh, anus region over there. So almost at the anus region, you find that uh, long uh, excretory pores. Um, it has four or six big tuft shaped cells uh, with a ramifying process uh, also uh, in close contact over here. So this is a, a network of transverse canal and this is the ramifying network that is the rennet cells. Uh, they absorb solid waste and transfer the same to the canals in a dissolved state and uh, ultimately they are thrown out through the excretory pore. So that is the excretory system in the ascaris. Nervous system. Um, I want you all to have a look at this nervous system very clearly over here. How is the nervous system made up of? The nervous system is having a pharyngeal, circumpharyngeal nerve ring. So this is the circumpharyngeal nerve rings. And uh, this ring is connected with some ganglia. What do you mean by a ganglia? Ganglia means uh, number of nerve cell bodies uh, present at one place and it gives a... Um, um, bulged like structure so that is what is called as ganglia so nerve cell bodies made up of ganglia so you have this ganglia over here on either side the ventral ganglia and also then uh, you have a sub dorsal ganglia over there uh, and then you have uh, uh, a dorsal ganglia a sub dorsal ganglia and uh, two ventral ganglias on either side the large ganglia and this uh, nerve, uh, pharyngeal nerve uh, ring gives out six um, anterior nerves over there, six small anterior nerves over there, which is uh, called as uh, the amphid. This is an amphid ring. This is a sensory um, uh, papillae with the sensory nerves. And there's one more sensory nerve here. So two sensory nerves and one amphid uh, um, nerve over there, uh, which is made up of six nerves on the anterior region. And on the posterior region, again, you have uh, six uh, over there, the dorsal, the ventral uh, uh, on either side, and also the uh, there is one more dorsal over there. So mostly it is made up of six nerves uh, over there and a, a central ventral nerve. Uh, so you have this, uh, the ventral single, uh, not central, single ventral nerve, uh, which is uh, again, uh, made up of ventral nerve ganglion on the uh, anterior side and also one more ganglia on the posterior side. And uh, they are made up of many nerve cells of here, branch nerve cells, because the tail region also have to have uh, lots of sensory uh, natures in them. So that is uh, the nervous system. You can just go through the matter of what, what I said is all that is present over there. And uh, sense organs, you will have to talk a little bit. Uh, if, if they ask you to write about the sense organs for a short question, then this is what you will have to talk about over here. What is the sense organs over here? Due to the parasitic mode of life, uh, Ascaris has developed sense organs which are very simple. They are either uh, as minute elevations or pits in the cuticle of the body. Minute elevation, I told you, that small, small pimple-like structures which comes out, minute uh, um, papillae-like structures, uh, outgrowth, what you call them. That those outgrowths are called as papillae, and these papillae are sensory in nature. So where all you find? Labial papillae. Where do you find this labial papillae? Labial papillae you find on the lip uh, of the uh, ascaris over here. As I told you all, they are made up of uh, three lips. That is six lips fused to form three lips. So remember that point. And uh, the mid dorsal lip over there, which is elliptical in shape, uh, they are made up of dorsal, uh, the double papillae. This is one papillae over here. This is another papillae over there. So they are made up of two papillae on the uh, 
the anterior uh, lip over there, uh, mid dorsal lip over there, and on the ventral uh, uh, lips, that is the um, um, oval shaped lips, you have single papillae, uh, which is having a double sensory pits inside. Uh, so don't get confused with the double papilla over here. There is one papilla over here. There is one papilla over here. That is the the either side. The lateral uh, ventral lips have only one one papillae, whereas the uh, dorsal mid dorsal lip has two papillae. So totally they are having three papillae, um, four papillae. Sorry, one papilla over here, one papilla over here. That is uh, on the mid dorsal lip you have two papillae and one on either side of the lateral ventral lips. So one, two, three, four. Four papillae you find on the uh, lips of uh, the nematode. So that is called as labial uh, papillae. And uh, what is the function of this labial papillae? They are gustatory or taste sensory. Um, uh, they have to taste, they, sh they should uh, like the taste of the food also. They can't just take whatever you give them to eat, right? So if it is very tasty, they are going to uh, take away all the digestive juices from the intestine. So gustatory or taste sensory in nature, that is labial papillae. Amphids, and if you can see amphids, if you remember the amphids, where it was near the mouth region uh, on the sides, you go, uh, I showed you all the picture of here. So this is an amphid. This is also uh, sensory in nature. Uh, how sensory, uh, what, what sensory nature it is? There are chemoreceptor sensory natures. So they have to know what is the type of the chemical uh, that is present in that environment. So uh, uh, even the amphids have this papillae on either side. And uh, what is the function? They are olfactory chemoreceptors, the smell and olfactory chemoreceptors. Pasmids, where is the pasmid present? It is present at the cloaca or the uh, tail end of the uh, nematode. So these pasmids are unicellular glands, single cell glands situated on either side of the tail and they are pit-like. And of course, uh, what is the function? They are also chemo receptors. So that is the sense organs. And uh, you have some more cervical papillae near the, uh, a small uh, papillae, a pair of uh, small pits situated just behind the oral lips. Just, just behind the oral lips, you have a cervical papillae. Uh, these are probably tactile in function. What do you mean by tactile in function? Touch sensitive. Touch sensitive is tactile in function. Then you have a cephalic papillae, cephalic head region right head region cephalic papillae also uh, pit like uh, being formed of nerve fibers surrounded by supporting cells and the last one you have a genital papillae uh, near the genital end uh, are uh, they are found in males uh, that is i told you all there were 50 pairs of uh, papillae pre anal region and five pairs in the post anal region so totally uh, you have 110 uh, papillae at the cloacal uh, region in the males, which is not found in the females. So these are the uh, sensory uh, organs of Ascaris lumbricoid. So if they ask you to write a short answer of sensory organs, you're going to talk about labial papillae, the amphids, the phasmids, the cervical papillae, the cephalic papillae, and the genital papillae. So don't forget this 50 pairs of preanal and five pairs of postanal papillae. Okay, so that was about uh, sensory organs. Then we are going to talk about the reproductive system in Ascaris. As we said, uh, they are uh, uh, different dimorphism. You have male and a female dimorphism is what you can see over here. So you have a single testis over here. Uh, over here. So, so this is a single testis. Uh, it is not double, so it's only a single testis. The testis is uh, connected with vas difference, a tube-like structure of vas difference. And this vas difference is in contact with the seminal vesicle over here. And this seminal vesicle is connected uh, to an ejaculatory duct. And from the ejaculatory duct, they are connected outside through the cloaca. So that is the reason why they don't have an anus over here through the, the cloaca and the ejaculatory duct is, is a continuous one because this is an intestine. Uh, the intestine is continuous over here and the intestine and an ejaculatory duct opens in a common duct called the 
cloaca and from there uh, ejaculation of the uh, sperms occurs over there and at that point uh, they also have a pineal spicule that is a sensory spicules uh, you can find over here so this dark uh, pin like structure this is called a pineal setae or a pineal spicules and this pineal spicule is found only in the uh, male nematodes uh, um, uh, which helps in uh, copulation so that is the um, male reproductive system and when you're going to talk about the female reproductive system you have a pair of ovaries uh, one ovary is uh, surrounded uh, around this uterus over here uh, so this is one pair of uh, uh, one ovary over here and this is another pair so you have a uh, a pair of ovary so this is the ovary where uh, development uh, the eggs are being released uh, ovary which is connected into a long oviduct over here and the oviduct is in turn connected to the uterus uh, containing eggs. So oviduct is connected with the uterus and both this uterus are connected into a common uh, entrance over there, the vagina and which opens into the vulva and uh, uh, the germinal uh, epithelium that you find in the ovary over there. So you have the germinal cells, the germinal cells, you call them, uh, which produces the egg or the ugonia and uh, this uh, uh, developed mature eggs are present in this uh, mid rachis over there. So you find all those developed eggs uh, that are present over here in the uterus, which ultimately open out and released outside. So here you can see uh, they have a different uh, opening, uh, uh, the female uh, gonophore opening over here, whereas the um, intestine uh, that is present over here directly opens outside through the rectum into the anus, which is not present in the male. In the male, you have a cloaca, whereas in the female, you have an anus. So uh, please remember that difference in the reproductive system over here. Coming to life history. So this is what you were talking about all the different organs in the Ascaris. Um, any, any doubt students up till now? Do you, did you understand all this uh, developments over there? Or do you have any yes, doubt? Sir. No problem. Okay. Now coming to life uh, history, uh, we'll quickly wind up with this life uh, history, a very small one. Uh, not as complicated uh, as the other uh, platyhelminthes or different uh, animals that we talked about. Coming to life history of Ascaris lumbricoids, as we said, it is a monogenetic uh, type of uh, life history here because they need only one host, that is humans mostly. So one host is uh, human, definitely man. And what happens soon after fertilization of the egg, when the semen, uh, when the cross fertilization occurs, uh, uh, after the fertilization, the glycogen globules of the egg migrate to the surface uh, to form a fertilization membrane and soon it hardens to form a thick uh, chitinous shell. Why a chitinous shell? Because uh, once it goes outside into the environment, they have to uh, take care of itself from different uh, hard, uh, unfavorable conditions. So when it is covered by a thick chitinous uh, shell, the uh, uh, fertilized embryo is safe inside. The zygote is safe inside. And uh, until a favorable condition returns, um, they are safe inside. So that is why they are made up of this chitinous shell. Soon thereafter, the fat globules of the egg form a lipoidal layer below the chitinous shell. So that's a chitinous shell. Inside the chitinous shell, they have a lipid layer, which is nothing but uh, you also can call it as yolk. Uh, have you seen the yolk uh, of a chicken? The yellow color one, the yellow color one is made up of uh, fat, lipids, uh, and the white color one is an albumin, which is uh, uh, proteinaceous in nature. That is why uh, all those who are uh, um, uh, very much uh, afraid of uh, putting on weight, uh, if they are very, um, uh, very much into uh, maintaining the size, they usually eat only the white part of the egg and not the yolk part because the yolk contains lots of fat in them. But uh, study says that uh, you have to have both if you want to have um, uh, the complete uh, nutrition from the egg, you have to have uh, the yolk and the uh, white part because we, we need both uh, fat and also the proteins. If you don't have fat, then we are devoid of uh, 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 the lubrication part is done only because of the fat. Uh, where all we have the lubrications, we have that uh, uh, fluids in between the joints, uh, uh, in between the small joints, uh, 
and and also uh, the moisture uh, collagen uh, development in the skin uh, is because of all these fat products so please don't avoid uh, the yellow part in the egg please uh, have all those okay uh, that is the lipoidal layer that is found inside the shell uh, the lipoidal layer the fertilized egg passes down the uterine wall uh, secretes an outer thick yellow or brown albuminous proteinaceous cover so this is what if you remember the chicken egg you can uh, write this point very easily first the lipoidal layer and then it is having the the proteinaceous uh, cover or a coat on uh, and uh, they have uh, um, the albuminous proteinaceous coat or outer shell having a characteristic wavy surface of uh, or rippling the the walls uh, has some rippling like structures so that is what he says over here the rippling or wavy structures uh, on the outer shell fertilized eggs or the zygotes are laid by the female ascaris in a small intestine so they where, where they have to lay their eggs they, they don't lay their eggs outside so they have to lay their eggs inside that is in the intestine from the intestine uh, along with the uh, food they move outside into the large intestine from the large intestine with an undigested food they are thrown out into the uh, by the feces outside and um, once they leave uh, the host um, they are in outside the environment one female may lay around 15000 to 2 lakhs eggs in a day imagine my goodness 15000 to 2 lakhs eggs in a day so its work is only to lay keep laying their eggs and uh, in its life uh, cycle a mature female can lay up to 27 million eggs so uh, you you will have to have a doubt over here when they are laying so many eggs millions and millions their population should have uh, outgrown even humans and um, of course the arthropods also but why uh, it is not happening is because once they are out in the environment uh, if there is a unfavorable condition or um, if the condition is not good enough for them to grow or if the host is not uh, if, if they don't enter a host they will ultimately die so even one egg uh, uh, enters a, a human, uh, it's enough for them for their survival. So that is the reason why they try to lay this many eggs, uh, almost millions of year. So two lakhs eggs per day is amount of uh, the number of eggs they lay. Okay, early development. So what happens after the eggs have been laid, after it has come out into the environment, what is happening? The stages of early embryo development, uh, that is the cleavage uh, or the segmentation starts in the soil. That is once they come outside, uh, when once they are thrown out uh, from the feces into the soil, once they come out of the uh, body, uh, warmth of the body into the environment outside, the cleavage starts to occur. And what is the pattern of the cleavage over here? The pattern of the cleavage is spiral cleavage and de uh, determinate. So they, each cell is determinate to become one particular uh, tissue over here. So what is that? The fertilized eggs undergoes two cleavages. So you can see over here, there are two cleavages, spiral cleavage over here. And uh, they form four cell stages over here. Right? And once they are in a four cell stage, they form a T-shaped. So first, when they undergo two divisions, uh, the dorsal cell is called AB cells and the ventral cell is called the P1 cell. Now, once this again undergoes uh, the second division over here, what happens over here? They become a four cell stage. The four cell stage resembles like that of a alphabet T over there. That is the dorsal AB becomes uh, A and B cell. AB has divided into A and B and the P1 over here divides into upper EMST and lower P2. Uh, that is uh, why uh, we are giving this name is because I, as I mentioned, uh, you call them as determinate. Each cell is going to form into one particular uh, tissue. That is, they have been determined to become like that. And after that uh, T-shaped, uh, later on, uh, they keep dividing and uh, a rhomboid shape uh, of cells is formed over here. Uh, when it is in a rhomboid shape uh, cell, you have a blastocele, that is a cavity that is present over here. So this is a blastocele and you have the primordial endoderm cells. 
uh, and of course the different uh, uh, cells that is named over here. Okay, thus the cleavage of the embryonic cell continues to give rise to blastula stage over here at a 16 cell stage which is characterized by having a blastocele and later uh, uh, little more uh, divisions of ear, you will have an outer ectoderm and in an inner endoderm and a stomodium that is being developed. So the stages, different stages of uh, cleavages that you found. The egg falls on the ground and can remain alive for months in the moist soil, uh, though uh, complete drying kills them. So they need a moist soil. That is best uh, moisture uh, when they when do they get uh, definitely during rainy season and a uh, winter season but if it is a summer season all the eggs are going to perish why because uh, they cannot survive a uh, uh, high temperature what is the temperature favorable temperature 85 degrees fahrenheit 85 degrees fahrenheit uh, is uh, like in a human uh, the temperature is um, 98.6 fahrenheit right uh, almost to 37 degrees centigrade but um, uh, they cannot uh, the cell uh, the eggs do not divide if it is going to stay in the humans itself so that is why they need a moist tem uh, temperature uh, the cleavage starts only when they fall into the soil and that too what is a favorable temperature 85 degrees fahrenheit that is almost to uh, 24 degrees uh, celsius i suppose 24 degrees, when, when do you get? Only during uh, winter season or uh, in the rainy season, you might get that temperature. So if they get that temperature is when cleavage begins to occur. Otherwise, they are going to die. So what happens? Finally, a juvenile is resulted in about 10 to 14 days from the beginning of segmentation. That is from the beginning of the cleavage. From the day the cleavage occurs till 14 days, a small juvenile is going to occur. How? Structurally, a juvenile possesses an elementary canal. This is a juvenile over here. Um, as I told you all, uh, they have those rippling wave-like structure. So this is what a rippling wave-like structure uh, you find in the eggs of this uh, scarus over here, the outer protein layer. Uh, then you have a zygote and an inside uh, lipoidal layer. This is how they look like. And... Uh, Inside uh, the development occurs uh, and uh, different uh, cleavages forms, uh, two or three larval forms are found over here uh, inside them. And uh, uh, what is occurring over here, the juveniles are being formed inside the eggs itself due to the uh, molting uh, nature that is present inside. And this is how uh, young juvenile uh, worm looks like with the mouth, the buccal cavity, uh, of course, the nerve rings and the pharynx, the intestine that is present the rectum and the anus. So what is happening over here? The structurally, juvenile possesses an elementary canal, the nerve ring, and of course, the lateral uh, excretory system. This juvenile resembles very much uh, with the rhabditis or the soil nematode. Hence, they are also referred to the, as rhabditiform larvae or rhabditoid. The larva mouth within the egg shell, um, it is there in about seven days and they become the second stage uh, juvenile larva from the cleavage, they become the, uh, from the first stage, they become the second stage juvenile larva or second stage rhabditoid. And this stage of life history of Ascaris is the infective stage to the host. So here, when they form the second stage of larva, this larva, first stage of larva, uh, when, when they are, uh, the zygote forms and uh, small uh, worm-like structure, they become the first larval form. And the first larval form undergoes the second larval form. When the ascaris gets into the second larval form is when this um, uh, eggs are infective stages with the second larval form. What happens? Once this enters the human, the development starts in the, inter in the body of the humans. Until then, they are waiting for a proper host to take them. How, how do we take them? Contaminated water. If the water is not clean, uh, if they are uh, mixed with feces, sometimes you uh, come across water being uh, 
um, polluted uh, in this uh, um, uh, manjira water or something. If the um, septic tank uh, has broken, they get mixed up with the uh, drinking water, uh, something like that happens. And uh, we ultimately drink that water without knowing uh, contamination occurs. The contamination also occurs when you are um, uh, drinking water from uh, not very clean place or uh, if the children are playing in the soil uh, where the feces are mixed up uh, over there, uh, they just put their mouth inside and they, uh, the eggs enter inside. So these are different various ways the ascaris can infect the humans. So data suggests that under favorable conditions of oxygen, moisture, and temperature, the eggs of the ascaris within uh, infective juveniles may remain viable for about six years in soil, imagine they can survive for six years in the soil, provided they have oxygen, they have the moisture, and also the temperature is conducive. So in the summer season, how can they maintain the temperature is because uh, when the when these uh, eggs uh, are underground the soil, uh, they have a little bit of uh, less temperature and moisture is maintained. So sometimes uh, they can survive even for six years in the soil in a juvenile state. So this is a juvenile state. This egg state is a juvenile uh, state, which is an infective uh, form of the ascaris over there. So how does the infection occurs? Uh, once the host swallows the infective eggs, uh, which is contaminated food and water, uh, when the infective eggs reaches the small intestine from the mouth, they uh, directly enter into the small intestine of the host. Once into the intestine, of the host, the egg shells are dissolved by the action of host digestive juices. The, uh, the egg shells, because of the action of the digestive juices, the egg shell is removed out. When an egg shell can be destroyed, why not the juvenile uh, ascaris uh, not be um, uh, 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 dissolved? Can anybody answer me? When the exhalation of the ascaris can be dissolved, why not the juvenile uh, also can be dissolved? Why can't the digestive juices of the humans uh, uh, kill the uh, juvenile ascaris? Anybody? It produces anti-enzymes. Exactly. <laughs> what it is covered with? Cuticle. Very good. Saida, very good. Thank you for the answer. Yeah, the animal is covered with cuticle and uh, the cuticle produces anti-enzymes and that is the reason why the human digestive juices cannot kill them. Only the egg shell, which is a protein uh, nature of uh, uh, the outer chitinous shell is broken down. And once uh, they are opened up, the juvenile comes outside, outside and they start living freely. So what happens after that? Once the juvenile is set free, what is the size of that juvenile? It is only about 0.2 to 0.3 mm, very, very minute, very, very minute. And uh, 13 to 15 microns in diameter. So they are very, very microscopic. You, know, you cannot see them with your naked eyes. And they have all the structures of the adult except the reproductive organs. What are the, all the other uh, structures of the adults? That is, they have their lips, they have their pharynx, they have their intestine. Everything is ready. They have to only eat and uh, grow in size. So they don't have any reproductive organs. Only thing they have is the other structures that an adult has. So what is the size? They are only 0.2 to 0.3 mm long. So what happens uh, once they are in the intestine? They, they, don't, uh, they can't stay in the intestine for a long time. So what they do is because uh, they have to undergo two more larval stages. Uh, they have to undergo two more larval stages. That is the third larval stage and the fourth larval stage. So what happens over here? If you can see in this picture over here, from the intestine, uh, once the eggs are released outside, uh, which are thrown out in the feces, they go uh, once into the soil, they develop by cleavage into a first stage larva. This first stage larva again grows to form second stage larva. And this second stage larva is the one that is the infective stages uh, when, when, a, when it enters a human is, a, uh, is where they are going to infect the humans once again. So what happens? This second stage larva once goes into the mouth of the humans. They go into the mouth of the human, reaches the intestine. Once in the intestine, the second stage larva hatches. That is the 
chitinous uh, outer covering is thrown out and the free swimming uh, larva comes out. This is a second stage larva. And this second stage larva from the intestine, they bore outside with the help of the triradiated lips. Uh, the lips also has uh, teeth, I told you all. They bore, that is, they pierce the intestinal wall. They come out into the outside of, uh, from the intestine, they come outside through the circulation, they go and reach the liver through hepatic uh, portal veins, the mesenteric canals from there they, into the hepatic portal uh, veins, they reach the liver. From there, they don't sit in the liver. They just take the food, proper food, uh, highly uh, nutritious food from the liver. And from the liver, they bore outside and they reach the right side of the heart from the liver. They bore outside from the uh, liver they, through the circulation. They go and reach the heart. So this is the heart. From the heart, through the circulation, they go and reach the uh, pulmonary sacs, that is the lungs. So the, they go and reach the lung. All this is done through circulation. Why? As I told you all, they are, they are very, very minute, microscopic, just 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 mm in length. So that is the reason why they are able to swim through the circulation. Now, once in the lungs, they, uh, they reach the alveoli, they pierce through the surface of the skin, and then they go into the alveoli. Inside the alveoli, the larva, the second stage larva, changes to third stage larva. And from the third stage larva, they change into the fourth stage larva. Fine. From first larval stage into the second larval stage, from the second larval stage, that is the infective stage that infects the intestine. Once in the intestine, the eggshell is broken out and you have a free swimming larva. From the intestine, they bore into the liver. From the liver, they reach the heart. From the heart, they reach the lungs. Here, the second stage becomes a third stage larva. From the third stage, they become the fourth stage larva. Now, this larva, fourth stage larva, is uh, a complete, uh, well-developed larva. What happens is from there, uh, from the alveoli, they reach the bronchi. From the bronchi, they reach the pharynx. From the pharynx, they reach the mouth. From the mouth, they are again swallowed through the use of fingers. They are not thrown outside. From the lungs, through the bronchial, uh, bronchioli, through the bronchi, bronchus, and from the bronchus to the pharynx, and the pharynx, from the pharynx, they come into the glottis region. From the glottis region, re they reach the mouth. From the mouth, they have to again go inside the esophagus, something like a U-shaped. They, they take a U-turn like that, and they reach the esophagus. Why do they have to reach the esophagus? Because they have to again reach the intestine. From the mouth, they go into the esophagus from the stomach, into the intestine. Because as I told you all, these round worms are free swimming um, stages that survive only in the intestine of the humans. So that is the reason why from the uh, pharynx into the mouth, from the mouth, again, they go into the esophagus, from the esophagus stomach and from the stomach into the intestine. There, they uh, start living. And uh, from the fourth stage, they become a young Ascaris. From young Ascaris, they become an adult Ascaris. When, when they are becoming an adult Ascaris, they develop their reproductive system and then they start reproducing in the intestine. So this is the uh, life cycle of uh, Ascaris lumbricoid. So you have to remember uh, all these different stages over here. Uh, was I clear with this development? Any doubt over here with the developmental stages? Any, any doubt, you can just uh, raise your hands. Uh, otherwise, if you have understood, well and good. I'm going to the next uh, uh, slide. So these are all what I was talking about. So I'm not going to again read everything. So you'll have to remember all this. And what I want you all to uh, remember is uh, the final molting, that is the fourth stage molting, takes place in 60 to 75 days. That is uh, almost two months, two to two and a half months uh, from the day they enter and uh, become uh, the adult. Uh, it takes uh, 60 to 75 days. And um, people with ascariasis often show no symptoms, but if symptoms occur, they can be light, uh, that is with the abdominal discomfort or pain. Heavy infection can block the intestine and slow growth in the children. 
and what is the other symptom uh, symptoms they have cough uh, and um, uh, because uh, why they have cough because they keep migrating from one place to another in our body uh, we have that uh, sensitivity uh, nature in our uh, in our system so we keep coughing so that is the symptoms over there and uh, this is how it looks like when an ascaris is moving around in your skin uh, this is a skin region where you can see this round worms uh, so you can see how they are around in nature this is also at the subcutaneous uh, region you can find uh, the round worms uh, living over there and uh, uh, these are the ascaris that have been removed from the intestine of man as i told you all uh, in a man at least almost uh, at a given time you can have 5000 uh, ascaris uh, living in the intestine uh, you can see the number of ascaris that is being removed from the intestine of the humans so this is uh, how they look like uh, and the symptoms over there not very dangerous but definitely uh, it definitely gives us discomfort as i told you all Uh, you have sometimes uh, abdominal discomfort and um, there's a block in the intestine once it is blocked uh, you can imagine uh, you will not be given proper uh, nutrition is not going over there uh, the food is not digested and it completely blocks the intestine so is when you have abdominal pain is when uh, it has to be operated and uh, uh, the ascaris have to be removed so this is the uh, life cycle of uh, ascaris uh, with that we come to the end of this topic any doubts or uh, was it clear enough yes students you can unmute your uh, mics and you can uh, ask uh, any doubts you have no doubts hello students are you all there or uh, did you leave no ma'am uh, so uh, uh, was it clear then yes, everything yes, was yes. fine yeah yes. so with that we complete uh, uh, ash elementus or it's also called as nemathy elementus or it's also called as nematodes so with that we come to uh, the end of this session over here so let's see when you all are having the next uh, next session you just uh, talk to your um, administration and let me know uh, because they haven't given me any dates as of now um, and uh, meanwhile if you have any doubt you can contact me on whatsapp uh, please don't keep asking me for uh, important questions uh, why because I, uh, as i'm taking the class i'm already telling everything to you all what is the important question separately to again keep telling it is uh, difficult um when you are studying for some exam uh, don't just take it as uh, important questions because everything is important and everything is informative uh, i wish you people read everything for your knowledge sake not for mark sake uh, try to understand what you all are studying uh, don't just read a topic for marks read the topic for information so when you're taking it as an information then definitely you don't need any important question you can just write whatever we ask you all to write okay so so with that we come to the end of the session okay so see you all the next time nice uh, meeting you all ma'am your contact number please i have already given no i am there on your whatsapp group i am there on your whatsapp group so you can just uh, check out my number over there yeah okay yeah uh, i've lost the current again okay then see you all next time thank you ma'am thank welcome. you ma'am welcome